Hi, everyone, and welcome to our Q&A uh, to follow Team Marco. My name is Joanne Parsant. I am the Director of Education for the California Film Institute. And here with me, as you can see, is the wonderful Giulio Vincent Gambuto, the Director of Team Marco. Um, I want to welcome all of you, our incredible CFI members, um, and thank you, as always, for being members. And, as, you know, I know we're all going through a particularly challenging time right now in so many different ways and having you guys kind of still there as part of our community, um, even if we cannot see you, um, means the world to us. Um, and I hope that you, well, I, I hope most of you have already watched the film. Um, if you haven't, uh, it's still gonna be available to watch through tomorrow. So, um, or if you wanna watch it again, because why wouldn't you? Um, right, Julia, why wouldn't you? Um, it's yeah. great. So it'll definitely, it'll definitely still um, be going on. Um, I'm here channeling my, my inner Nano, um, if, uh, if you did watch the film. Um, and I wanna thank Julia for this fabulous gift of a hat that, uh, that he gave out during the film's world premiere at the Mill Valley Film Festival. Yes. Um, so uh, I just, I'm so thrilled that we were able to bring it back and share it with our members and, and to have Julia back with us um, live from New York, as they say. Um, to talk about the film a little bit. So, so welcome, thank Julio. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's great Absolutely. to be here. It's good to see you again. You too. Um, can you, let's just start off maybe by telling us a little bit about, you know, I never get tired of hearing the story of how you conceived um, the idea for this film. Um, as I said before, in, in, in the last time we showed the film and anytime I talk about it, you know, it's, it is actually very rare to have um, an independently produced live action feature. Um, for families um, outside of the studio system, like you're, you're, you're kind of, in my mind, a, a serious trailblazer and an incredibly, uh, I'm just grateful the fact that you, you did make a film of this kind for such a wide audience. But I'd love to hear, um, you know, have you share a little bit about how you came to this particular story? Sure. Well, first, thank you and thanks for having me. It's nice to be with everybody, even though I can't see you. Uh, hello from New York City. Um, it's really a pleasure to be able to present the film to you, and I'm grateful and heartened that you, uh, that you, that you watch, so thank you. Uh, I'm incredibly proud of the movie. It, uh, it's been in, it was in development for a number of years uh, as I left film school and as I started the production company that made it here in New York City. And the idea really came, uh, Joanna's heard this story, but I'll tell you, the idea really came because uh, I have, I'm the uncle of six, uh, one niece and five nephews. So there are six of them uh, from the age of three all the way up to the age of 11. And I love them dearly. I come from a very close knit Italian American family here in New York City. And so I'm very much in their lives and very much in the day to day. And so one day I walked in the house and my nine-year-old nephew didn't say hello and didn't even look up from the screen. And that's kind of a cardinal sin in our family. <laughs> so um, suddenly I just became my grandfather, you know, like I'm not a really traditional guy in my own life, but I suddenly just became my grandpa Julio and uh, and started yelling at the kid. And I was like, get up, get off the screen, come say hello, give me a kiss and a hug. And and uh, and the idea was born really because um, I, I sort of in that process or in that moment had remembered that my grandfather when he was alive was fascinated by technology. And when Google Home was invented or Google Earth was invented, before he died, I showed him the house that he grew up in, um, uh, in Brooklyn. And so uh, this is my American grandfather, not my Italian grandfather. And so when I uh, showed that to him, he was fascinated. So I thought, what a fun idea and what a great exploration to bring these generations together. And what would it be like to put into a film the generation that my nephew is with the generation that my own grandfather was uh, and what would that look like? So we made the math work out between all the ages, but, uh, but we, were, we were able to put them into the same movie. So before I go on with more questions of mine, I just, I forgot, I should point out that we have um, an option obviously for anyone of you uh, who are watching to be able to ask questions of, of Julio through the Q&A um, window. So there's a, a little icon that should be at the bottom of your screen. I think, I'm not sure if it might be different if you're on an iPad, but just look for the little icon that says Q&A, click on that and you can type in your question 
um, for Julio and I will gladly um, ask it for you. Um, we also have the chat window um, that you can click on and then type in any comments you might have as we're going along. If you want to just, you know, say a few words about the film or, or you know, what it brings up for you, um, feel free to type along in there as well. Um, so uh, give us a little background about your Staten Island roots and how that kind of worked into the film, since it's obviously, you know, Staten Island is kind of like an additional, an additional character in the sure. film. And as someone who grew up in New York, yet, uh, knew nothing about Staten Island. And, and I think that that's the case for a lot of New Yorkers. So, uh, you know. Many people don't know much about it. Uh, if you live in the area, you've probably driven through it or sat in traffic on the island. Uh, but it's a beautiful place. And I, one of my goals for the film was to really showcase how beautiful it is. The island, uh, which many people don't know, is twice the size of Manhattan. And most people, especially New Yorkers, think that it's very tiny because we are sort of the uh, Alaska and Hawaii of the New York City subway map. We're kind of like put in this little box in the bottom that says this island also exists in our city, uh, but it's never able to be shown truly at scale. So most people don't know how big it is. It's home to about a half a million people. So it makes it the least dense borough of the, of the city and 65% of it is reserve land. So most of the island is very green. And so we're the borough of parks. There are, I think something like 200 parks on the island, excuse me, um, I may have that number wrong, but it, there's a, a, a large number of parks on the island and, uh, and it's a beautiful place. So I grew up there and I left to go to college, uh, moved back to New York City after school for just a little bit and then moved out to California and lived in Los Angeles on and off for about 20 years. So uh, in 2017, when I finished up film school, I moved back to New York and moved to Staten Island. So I lived there for three years while we were finishing raising the money for the production company and for the film. And then while we were in production and in post-production. And it was wonderful. And it was really great to be home. And it was a very surreal experience as well to be kind of taking my film crew to the very restaurants and diners that I went to when I was in high school. Uh, but we had a really great time shooting the film there. It's a community that I think is um, very giving, very loving, very generous. And I, I think that that comes through in the film. And, um, and it was a pleasure to make the movie there. And we really had a lot of support from not only Borough Hall, which are the administration of the Borough President, which works with New York City Parks to make sure they made sure we could shoot in all the parks that we shot in. We shot in five parks in the movie. And then, um, you know, local business owners were very much a part of the production of the film. All of our craft services food was from local restaurants. And um, we started a community partner program where they could actually invest in the movie by giving us food um, uh, for the crew. And so I tried to do some fun things and or uh, innovative things as a producer as well, just to involve the community. And, you know, you can see in that last scene at the bocce tournament, those are all people who supported the film. That was kind of a bit of a wrap party for us when we were shooting to have them all join us at the, at the local beach and be extras in the film. So it was really fun to have them have them involved in that way. And how, is bocce really that popular there in Staten Island or just within the Italian American community or how did bocce become like the thing? Yeah, it's really big on Staten Island. So we have, um, you know, most communities when they're fundraising have golf and tennis outings. We have golf and tennis and bocce outings. <laughs> so it's been very, I think in the last few years, it's actually gotten more popular um, uh, across the island because it's a very social sport and it's something that if you don't play, golf or tennis or um, uh, country club sports like that, you can, you know, you can get involved um, and, and have fun doing it. And uh, it's kind of funny because I was in Palm Springs visiting some family friends a few years ago when we were first starting to make the movie and, or be right before we went into production. And uh, they had just put a bocce court in their like local club. And my friend was fascinated and she was like, oh, look, your people are here. You're, the sport is here. And it's a really popular sport all across the country. I mean, there are thousands of leagues, bocce leagues across America. And, uh, and it's a fun sport and it's a social sport. So 
Uh, we do play a lot of it, and now because of the movie, I play a lot of it. So, <laughs> so we have a uh, you know a whole set of courts in the league right here in downtown San Rafael. Um, and well, and you don't have to be super athletic, which is nice. And there's always food and and yeah. attached to it, which is nice. And you play outside; it's great. Yeah. I actually I remember learning about you when I was a little kid. I don't think I've played it in a while, but yeah, it's really fun. Too. We go. We have a little office settings. Um, so tell us, tell us a little bit about the casting. It's such a great cast and, you know, Owen and no, no, like just, you know, how you, how you pulled that, that together. Sure. Casting was a tough process because I wanted to make sure that I had incredible actors and having access to incredible actors when you're making your first feature film is often difficult. And um, I kind of didn't let up until I had the people who were really right in those roles. And um, they all came to the production from a different way, really. We, we had casting sessions in New York. I wanted it to have a real New York feel. Uh, Joanne, I've told you this before, but I'll share it with everybody. You know, a lot of people come into the audition sort of like talking like this and, you know, or, chewing gum and making the, you know, the mom sound like that. And, you know, I think that those are caricatures and, and certainly fun traits of a character, but I felt really strongly like I didn't want the movie to feel like that. And that this was not sort of in the line of mafia movies. This was not really, um, I didn't want to showcase that part. Uh, of the island, because I feel like that's so stereotypical of what the island is or what New York City is. And, and trust me, much of it is true, but I felt like, you know, if we have one bocce player or two bocce players um, uh, who sort of feel like that, we would be okay. I wasn't sure how I felt about watching a 90 minute movie that felt like, you know, married to the mob or something. So I was very specific about that. And, uh, and was really, I was just looking for actors that could really embody these characters so that you didn't feel like they were acting and that you could spend 90 minutes with them and love them and fall in love with them. And so that was kind of my compass in the room. Was I in love with them? Did I fall in love with them as a director? Did I want to spend more, more time with them? And so um, actually of the three, meaning no, no, Marco and Anna, the mom. Uh, Anna came first into my world and walked into an audition in New York. And she was obviously very beautiful um, and sort of felt like the character, but I wasn't sure um, how the audition was gonna go. But she sat down and she said, look, I just had a baby three weeks ago. What you see is what you get. And, yeah, and it was that kind of authenticity that I loved and really fell in love with from her. And I knew that audiences would feel for her as well. So she was sort of the first person in the equation. And then um, we were holding out for, for the Nono character because it's such a specific you know, age and feel and um, background. And, and uh, second was Marco, so Owen Vaccaro, who was uh, most recently at that time in a movie called A House with a Clock in Its Walls uh, from Universal, which was uh, with Kate Blanchett and Jack Black. He's the little boy from the Daddy's Home franchise, Daddy's Home 1, Daddy's Home 2. And I had been auditioning kids in New York and my sister kept saying, you have to get this kid, you have to get this kid, you have to call his agent, you have to get in touch. And, and truthfully, I sort of just put a pin in it and, and I knew his name. But um, I was very focused your on- work, Your sister doesn't work in the industry. This was just- Oh no, I'm sorry, industry. just to clarify. My sister, my sister was our head of hair and makeup. She runs a salon uh, on Staten Island in New York City. She doesn't work in the business. I've been trying my best to sort of expose her to the business along the way uh, on my journey. And she's gotten a little bit more experience here and there. And you know, a, a small independent film was the perfect place for her. To, uh, to start to work on set. And she's incredibly talented and has a really big following on Staten Island. But no, she does not work in casting. So she does not work in, in entertainment. But, and that's what I said to her. I said, you know, are people gonna know who he is? And she said, every mother at my school knows who that kid is. So, um, so I called his agent, we passed the script along 
And his family, it turns out, is an Italian-American family who live in Atlanta. The parents are my age and, and fell in love with the script. And five days later, his contract was done and he was, uh, he was committed to doing the movie. And so he came to Staten Island and he and his parents lived in the Hilton on Staten Island for the five weeks that we shot. And they're wonderful people. So we had a really nice time with them. And then the last piece of the puzzle was no, no. And Anthony Patelis walked into our last audition. I said, let's just have one more audition in New York. Let's bring in whoever we can, you know, whoever sort of fit the criteria. And he walked in and as soon as he opened his mouth, I was in love and I just thought, oh, he's so great. And then we started doing chemistry reads, which is part of the process where you start to put the actors together and see how they feel together. And it just worked. It really worked very well. The funny part is that Anthony is Greek. He's not from an Italian background. His, his ancestors are Greek. And so he said he's just, he was just channeling his Greek grandfather and it worked and it was beautiful. Um, and he was so committed and so incredibly dedicated to the project. And I spent four or five weeks looking at him in Nono's costumes and with Nono's haircut. And I sort of got used to the fact that here was this, you know, sort of 70, 80 year old man. And he came to the rap party with like black hair and a Metallica t-shirt on. And he was, you know, he's much younger in real life and feels much younger and doesn't have uh, the European accent. So uh, he fooled me. So, <laughs> so. But I, I, just to wrap that up, thought up, you know, all of them came uh, to me in a different way. And uh, I think we assembled a really great cast. You did, you did. Um, you also have, there's a member of a critical part of your crew, I guess, but you know, of the filmmaking team who's, who's from here from, originally from Marin, correct? Uh, yeah, so our editor, Nick Wright, uh, is originally from Marin, grew up, funny enough, he used to be a ticket taker. Like he worked uh, as an usher um, at, at the main theater in San Rafael, um, where CFI is, is housed. So it's, it's so funny because when we opened at Mill Valley, he, uh, he had a whole bunch of friends, friends and family who joined and, and it was uh, very much a homecoming for him. So. Yeah, his parents still live in San Antonio, I believe. Yeah. Mm. Nice having that local connection. Um, yeah. So one of the main things, obviously, you know, that, that you focus on and address in the film is, you know, sort of this use of screen time by young people and, so, you know, finding that balance and, you know, acknowledging the value of technology, but figuring out where it fits. Now, since we showed the film and obviously since you made the film, you know, we've moved into this very bizarre time that we're now living in where, as you, we are all, as yeah. proven by this, sitting in front of our screens on a daily basis, making, you know, any sense of balance feel that much more challenging. How do you sort of, how do you just how do you feel about that in that context of you know what the message that you were trying to drive home in the film kind of how it relates to what we're dealing with now you know and what families are dealing with now in that situation well, sure it's funny joanne because as soon as the uh social distancing period i'll call it started uh i was getting texts and messages from uh, from moms and dads all over New York saying, that's it, they can have as much screen time as they want. <laughs> and that was the first thing that went out the window uh, as a parent who was trapped at home and had to homeschool kids, which is all via screen now. You know, the point of the movie is to, is to put it in its proper place, right? And the point of the movie is not really to demonize technology, you know, I think at the end of the film, Marco says, uh, Grandpa no no knew that we were never going to be without our cell phones and without our laptops. And, but he wanted to make sure we didn't forget the traditions that came before. And when we were writing that line and when we were, when we were developing the film, we had to clarify that message as much as possible because I think it's easy to look at the movie and think, oh, this director hates technology. And look, it was shot on a digital camera. It's gonna be distributed digitally. We're doing press and we're doing these Q and A's digitally. Um, I, for one, don't believe that, the, uh, that technology is, is inherently a bad thing. I just think it's important that A, we use it to its best effect and for its best purpose which is connection when you can't be connected otherwise, which we're seeing now. 
um, education in some, in some levels. I believe in keeping screen time smart and keeping it engaging for people, uh, especially for kids. Um, uh, one of the things I've been doing during this quarantine period is I, I've been doing a trivia show every day for, it started just for my nieces and nephews because I didn't get to see them. And then their friends started coming. So I'm doing this like Facebook live stream every day. And it's a kid's trivia show. And one of the things that I've sort of come to in that process is the realization that we need to keep our screen time smart. You know, we need to keep our screen time something that's really educational for kids. Are they getting something out of it? I find that kind of screen time way more valuable than my nephew or my niece, like obsessed with YouTube videos of like other kids playing with other toys. <laughs> like it's a very bizarre to me to watch that. Um, and then, so yeah, I think that things have really shifted in the last few weeks, certainly in the last month culturally and we're going to see screens be even more integrated into our lives in order to keep us safer and away from each other a little bit more when it's necessary so i think it's important that uh, that we teach our kids and that our kids are exposed to exactly you know how to make it uh, a helpful tool instead of a distraction from life you know right excellent so one of the things that I think is, you know, well, there's so many things I love about the film, but, um, you know, the, the very, the authenticity of the family dynamics, um, whether, you know, the, the relationships with the, you know, the, the divorce, relationships between the, you know, the parents, um, the relationship obviously between the grandparents. But the one thing, the one choice that you made that I thought was, um, was really, I mean, it sounds weird to say it was wonderful, but it, it felt so right with, where the choice that you made to actually have no, no die. Um, which, you know, a lot of films of this nature might not do that and would want to, you know, would not consider that to be a happy ending, so not an appropriate ending, but I thought you just handled it so brilliantly, and I just would like to hear a little bit more about, you know, that choice and how you knew that you could, you know, make that the right ending that felt right for the story. First, thank you. Uh, thanks. We, uh, when we were in production, we had Camp Let No No Live and Camp uh, Let No No Go. And, uh, and it was really a point of contention among uh, our whole team. So just so you have some context, the way that I run my team is very inclusive across the board. Like I love asking everyone who's involved what they think of the script and what they think of the characters. And so um, everyone from the executive producers to the PAs gave their opinion, right? Because my job as the director is to, is to uh, filter all of that and to make the decision that I think is right for the story. Um, but it doesn't mean that I don't want to hear what people think. And so if I'm good at my job, it means I can take all of this input and, and process it. And, and hopefully that's what happened. But, but people were very, very committed to the, to the, to the camp of let no, no live at the end. And I think ultimately it came down to a decision for me that the movie's, all, the movie's really about legacy and what we leave behind and what we carry forward to the next generation, whether that's games or ways to communicate and show love or your hat or you're like my own grandfather gave me the footage that's in the movie. Uh, so, uh, for those of you at home who don't know this yet, all of those eight millimeter films were from my grandfather. And the woman in those films who in the film is Nona is my grandmother who is still alive. She's 94 right now. And those are uh, films of her in the 1960s. So that was passed on to me and all my cousins wanted like his watch and his desk and his this and his that. And I said, just please just leave me the films. And so my point is the movie's about legacy. And I thought the only way to really make the movie about legacy uh, is that at the end, the character has to not be with us anymore. And in order for the, for the boy to really understand the lesson that his grandfather was trying to teach him, he couldn't be there anymore. So it was a hard choice. And then of course it becomes, how do you execute that creatively so that it's uh, done right and done gracefully 
and uh, and then we had to figure that out. So, uh, and one of the things that I did, Joanne, was I asked parents that were close to me, you know, how would you feel about showing a film to your child where one of the main characters dies? And they all said, have you seen a Disney movie lately? <laughs> like, you know, like, they usually maybe, kill them oh. first. They usually kill them yeah, first at the exactly. beginning. So, you know, wait till um, it's a little bit different because the main character you're watching for an hour and a half doesn't die. But um, yeah. kids are much savvier than sometimes we give them credit for. And they're exposed to more things than we think that they're exposed to. And so my task became, how do you do it gracefully? How do you do it beautifully? And Hopefully we rose to that task. I think you definitely did. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what the path for the film is from here? Like what you're, what you're working on, how you're trying to get it out in the world and how sure. our, these awesome members of ours can help support that? Sure, so um, the film opened at Mill Valley. It opened its festival run in October with CFI and with Mill Valley and it was extremely, fun and exciting and funny enough about a hundred people flew in for which now seems unimaginable right but at the time in october a hundred people flew in from new york city to uh to 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 be with us to open the film there and uh since then it's gone on to about 15 other festivals its full festival run would have been this year and so it's an official selection at over 42 festivals in 11 countries throughout the world. Uh, unfortunately, many of those festivals have either been postponed or canceled or moved online. Uh, so right now we are uh, completing sort of some of our online festivals and uh, the movie is, is behind the scenes sort of on the market. So we're looking for distribution. We will likely have um, an online distribution strategy, meaning that there will likely be a distributor who comes on board to perhaps open it in theaters for a small run and then make it available for, um, for on-demand viewing. And uh, unfortunately, the business is, is suffering at the moment. And I think movie theaters are going to suffer when we come back, quote unquote. So the truth is, I don't know what the theatrical run of this film looks like. Uh, as a director, you know, you want to see your movie in every theater across the world. I think it is more likely that the film will, um, will go direct to homes, directly on VOD and be available. And um, I don't care how it gets to people. I just want children and families to see it and enjoy it and appreciate it. So uh, the most helpful, truly, uh, the, you know, support wise, uh, you know, follow us, follow our social media, go on to Team Marco Movie uh, on Facebook or Team Marco Movie on Instagram. Um, I think that's a really great way. Distributors do look at that. They look at what our audience is and could potentially be. So if you like the film, uh, you know, I would be honored and grateful if you would follow those social channels. And what is, where can people watch your trivia show every, every night? What's that? Where can people watch your trivia show every night? Oh, sure. Come on down. It's so fun. So my, uh, my real name is Giulio, which is an Italian name. Uh, my mom changed the spelling when I was a kid from G-I-U-L-I-O, which is the traditional Giulio, to J-U-L-I-O. So I always joke that she made me Latino. <laughs> so, but my nieces and nephews call, my niece and nephews call me Uncle Julie. So the trivia show is called Uncle Julie's Kids Trivia Show. And it's on Facebook and on YouTube, six o'clock Eastern every day during the week. And then I do a special adult show on Friday nights. Uh, I made the commitment to our audience, which is children of friends and family so far that uh, I would do it until life kind of went back to normal a little bit. So I don't know when that's gonna be. Um, but you can go to unclejulie.tv, unclejulie.tv. And uh, you know you can click on Facebook or YouTube to watch it. So. And can you just give us a quick on, on what your the next film that you are working on that's sort of in the in in process in development? Sure. So uh, our next film, which we were going to shoot this summer and will now be shooting next spring, uh, is called The Julie Stories, and it is a story of an American family in the 1990s who wants 
to achieve the American dream by starting their own business and it does not go so well. And so the movie is based on my family in the 90s. My dad started a business when I was in the uh, eighth grade and it was kind of a mess. And so uh, the story is really about income inequality through the lens of an American family in the 90s. And uh, I'm setting it in the 90s because I think there's something particularly unique about that time where we as a country felt invincible and we felt like, you know, the, the, the Clinton administration, under the Clinton administration, we could do anything. And um, ev everyone was becoming a millionaire and why shouldn't you, you know? So uh, I'm really excited about it. I made the short film version of it when I was in graduate school. Uh, and you can watch that online. That's available. That's public at the juliestories.com, the juliestories.com. Um, it's a 15 minute short, or I think it's like a 12 minute, it's a 12 minute short. And the short film was a little bit more, feels a little bit like TV. Like the short film feels a little bit more sitcom-y. The short feels a little bit more um, uh, something you might see on ABC or NBC. Uh, the movie is going to be a little bit more raw, a little less polished like that. The whole film is going to be shot through the perspective of the younger boy, who is kind of my character at 13. And he gets a camcorder for his confirmation. <laughs> and so he records the story of their starting this business through his camcorder. So we're taking a really different tact and a, a different... Uh, direction with it creatively and I hope that's going to lend the story a little bit more uh, grit and a little bit more opportunity for uh, for a little bit less polish actually than Marco has because I think the story is a little bit more raw so that's the next movie well I do have before we wrap up I do have one question from um, an audience member who said sure. that um, they, loved, they loved the evil ex-husband um, and wanted to know who he is <laughs> Say that again, who he is. Who is he? Who is he? Okay, so the actor. Uh, the actor is a man named Louis Canselmi. Uh, he's on the show Billions right now. Uh, he was on The Looming Tower. He, I had the great privilege of seeing him uh, in Shakespeare in the Park last summer here in New York City uh, in a production of Coriolanus. He's fantastic. So if you look him up, He's on TV right now, and, and uh, he's an incredible actor, and uh, he did a really great job with that character. So. That's it. Um, and another question, um, uh, a woman who is, uh, she actually teaches Italian, and she's very interested in it for her students um, and for her kids who are Italian-American teens, and she wants to know where she can watch it. Where she can watch? The film. <laughs> Other than, well, so the film, well, one thing to, to note to, to Maria, who left, who asked this question, is that the film, if you're a member and you have the link, it's, it's still available to watch through tomorrow on, uh, in the CFI member screening room. Um, beyond that. Yeah, so beyond that, it's not available yet, but we are working on it. So hopefully I'll have some news soon that I can share with you and um, I'll share it with CFI so that um, all of our, all of your members can know when it's available. Um, we're so grateful because many, many people have, who have seen it have said, I want to show my family and I want to show my friends and I can't wait for that moment. And uh, hopefully it's coming soon. So uh, we are hard at work on that. And as soon as we have a distribution deal in place, um, I'll let you know where to find it. But you can follow teammarco.movie right now. Uh, that's our website for the film. And any news about the film will be posted there. So uh, if you go to teammarco.movie, uh, you can follow there. So. Do you want to make any mention of any potential thoughts around uh, being able to share, particularly with educators and students in the future? Or? Sure, absolutely. So uh, we just started, so the company that I run is called Burrow 5, and that's the production company that made the film. And so we have partnered with CFI. Um, myself and Joanne have partnered <laughs> to, to make it available uh, to make it available to schools. So we're gonna start doing that in the Northern California area through CFI and the movie will be available uh, for teachers and for administrators to 
uh, to show in their classrooms, whether they're digital classrooms, virtual classrooms, or physical classrooms. And then we're gonna roll that out uh, to the rest of the country, um, it, probably by the end of the year, I think, to make it available um, for anybody to, uh, uh, to, to screen for a classroom. And that's something I said we're working on now. Obviously, we'll let you know through CFI Education when that becomes available. And uh, they're currently, when we did show the film at Mill Valley Film Festival, we did actually do several school screenings with Julia, which were super, super fun for tons of students. They were so um, great. And it's so, so part fun of to that, watch it with kids. Yeah. <laughs> um, part of that uh, was we developed a curriculum guide to go along with the film um, for use in classrooms. Um, and Julie and I were working with the, to, to update that a little bit for our current situation. And so that will also be part of that package. And so yeah, you'll hear, you'll hear more from us about that soon. But the, the current curriculum guide actually is available on the CFI website. If you go to the education tab and go to our curriculum resources, you will find it there for free download if you wanna take a look. Um, and I think we're, we're out of time, Julia. Oh no. It's time to say goodbye. Yes. Well, thank you, everybody. Uh, I could do this all night, but I'm glad and uh, to have the privilege of joining you, and I appreciate the invitation. So thanks for having me, and um, I'm glad that you, I hope you, enjoyed the movie. It's been a pleasure, Julia. Thanks so much, and thank you all so much for joining us. Bye, everybody. Stay safe.